Okay, what we've done up to now is mostly look at projectile motion in the absence of air resistance. What we're going to go to look at in this last part of um, the projectile motion series is looking at the effect of air resistance. Now up until now we've looked at things uh, quantitatively, so we've you know done calculations and um, all that sort of thing, mostly. Um, the majority of what we're going to look at with air resistance is basically qualitatively, so just sort of explaining it. We'll touch on a little bit of mass, but you do not need to know the details of the mathematics for this stuff that we're going to do on air resistance. Cheers. So what do we need to know? We need to know that when a body, sorry, use my pointer up here, when a body moves through a medium such as air, the body experiences a drag force that opposes the motion of the body. Now, in the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more detail about the, the direction of these forces and that sort of thing. But to start off with, we need to explain the effects of speed, cross-sectional area of the body, and the density of the medium on the drag force on a moving body. And basically, I won't read the whole of these last two points, but we need to understand the concept of terminal velocity, which I'm going to talk about here. So, firstly, addressing this first dot point. The following factors affect the force of air resistance. Speed. The greater the speed, the greater the air resistance. And it's not actually, in fact, a linear relationship. Um, like I said, you don't need to remember this formula, but some of us like to think mathematically. This is the formula that tells us the amount of the drag force, or the amount of force due to air resistance. And what we see is it's got a velocity squared relationship. So if we double the velocity, we get four times the force. If we triple the velocity, we get nine times the force. So velocity has a really big impact on the air resistance. The second is the cross-sectional area. The larger the cross-sectional area, the greater the air resistance. I think that makes sense. So if all other things were equal and we compared, say, this golf ball with the tennis ball, um, purely because the golf ball has less cross-sectional area, it would have less air resistance than the tennis ball. And if we had a tennis ball and compared it to a basketball, the tennis ball would have less air resistance than the basketball because it's got less cross-sectional area. Um, in the formula, if you want to think of it mathematically, A is the cross-sectional area. The next two are the... Um, which I'll, Actually, I've just... Oh, no, sorry, not up to there yet. The, the air density um, has an effect on the air resistance. So the greater the air density, so the, basically the thicker the air, the heavier the air, whatever you want to say, the greater the air resistance. Um, some of you might know I play golf. One thing that you'll notice with golf is if you play golf at higher altitude, um, there's less air pressure. As you go higher and higher, there's less air pressure so that there is basically less air resistance at higher altitudes, um, so you don't get as much drag. Um, I don't recommend this, but you know the air resistance generally, if you like, normally say at sea level, will be at lowest when you've got a low pressure system is when you're likely to get thunderstorms and that sort of thing. So you know if you want to hit the golf ball a long way, go play golf in a thunderstorm. The only problem with that is you might get struck by lightning, and that's a bit of an issue. Um, the next thing that affects the air resistance... Oh, sorry, back to the formula here. Uh, D is the density of... says the density of the fluid, but the fluid in this case is air that we're talking about. The next thing is texture. Um, air flows better over a slightly rough surface, hence dimples on a golf ball help the ball further, but slower over a very rough surface, like a tennis ball. So if you had something that was the same shape and size as a golf ball with no dimples, it wouldn't actually fly as far. The dimples actually help the air go more smoothly over that ball and it will fly further. However, if you get a rough, rough surface, like say a tennis ball, it will get to the point where um, the surface is so rough that you will get greater air resistance and it will slow it down. Um, it's also part of the reason um, that you get both conventional swing with a cricket ball and then reverse swing. You'll get conventional swing with a new ball just to that slight roughness of the seam. The air will flow better over one side than the other, so one side will fly faster through than the air than the other, 
and the ball will swing. However, when they talk about the ball going reverse, that's when one side gets so rough that you actually, like rough like a tennis ball, that you actually get slower air movement over that side of the ball. It's also why a taped up, half taped up tennis ball is a really good thing to, to swing bowl with if you're playing backyard cricket. Um, the other thing that affects the amount of air resistance is the shape. Some shapes are more aerodynamic than others, and the more aerodynamic a shape, the less air resistance. And we could compare here, an old delivery van or a combi van is gonna have a much, the shape is gonna be much less aerodynamic than say the, the Ferrari I think I've got there, which is designed for air to flow over really, really efficiently. Yeah, part of it's the cross-sectional area, but it's also the way that they use slopes and that sort of thing to make sure that the air flows over that really, really um, efficiently. And in terms of our formula, the, the drag coefficient is a measure of the texture and the shape, which is basically the, the aerodynamic, um, the, the, you know, how aerodynamic that shape is. Now, um, if you go to that projectile motion, um, the, the simulation, the FET one that we already used in the earlier, that's got a little drag module. It's really worth having a play around with that and looking at some of these factors and doing some experiments. I think we'll do our first summative prac also on looking at drag. Um, next, we need to just think about this, co this concept of terminal velocity. Now we know, we're gonna picture here, we've got a skydiver falling out of an aeroplane and that skydiver obviously has a force due to gravity that's pulling them down towards the surface of the earth. But they will not just keep, you know, a force will cause an acceleration, so an increase in velocity. They won't just keep getting faster and faster and faster and faster and faster though, because the faster they go, the drag um, increases. And eventually you reach a point where the drag force going up is equal to the gravitational force going down. Um, and when these two things are equal, so when F D equals F G, so when the drag force is equal to the gravitational force, that means that we reach a point where there's basically no net force, so no total force, no net force. Oops, let's just jump around. Let me just move that back. Uh, no net force. I'm never sure. I think net in that case. I don't know if that should be double T or not. Lucky we're not doing a spelling topic. No net force. Therefore, no net force, no acceleration. Therefore, we reach a constant terminal velocity. So if we just quickly go back, explain that terminal velocity occurs when the magnitude of the drag force results in a net zero net force on a moving body. So drag force equals gravitational force. Describe situations such as skydiving where the maximum speed or the maximums and the maximum speed of racing cars where terminal velocity is achieved. So um, for skydiving, is it about 200 kilometers an hour? The drag force will equal the gravitational force. So you will accelerate until you get to about 200 kilometers an hour, and then you will basically, that would be your terminal velocity. Obviously, you know, whether you're laying flat or diving will have some effect on that, but, but it's about 200 kilometers an hour. We all know most cars, they won't just keep accelerating forever. With a car, eventually you'll reach a point where the, the drag, due to basically pushing the car through the air will equal the force being generated by the, the propulsion system of the car and the car will reach its terminal velocity. That's it for this one. Let's get into the last bit of air resistance next. So let's examine the, the nature and the direction of this air resistance force a little bit more. 
If we can imagine a projectile going through the air here, just I've picked a couple of points, we've got the velocity vector here going in the direction of motion at any point. And we've got gravity always acting straight down um, on that projectile. Now, the air resistance force, the force due to air resistance, will always act in the opposite direction to the velocity vector. So whatever the velocity vector, so let's call this drag. I tend to use drag or air resistance a bit interchangeably, but that's writing one less letter. So let's just, the direction of this drag force will always be directly opposite to the velocity vector. And then again, we can start to think about this in terms of its horizontal and its vertical component. So obviously, there is a, there's a part of this drag force in the horizontal direction that will slow the horizontal velocity. And then there is another part of this velocity. Um, just looking here for a different coloured pen and I'm running out, I'll just use black. And then there is a vertical component. So this, if you like, this drag force has a vertical and a horizontal component like that. And again, if we look at this further up, we can see we've got a vertical component to the drag force here and we've got a horizontal component here. So, what, why are we doing this? Why are we looking at it like this? Firstly, there's the direction of the drag force. The total drag force is always exactly opposite to the velocity vector. It's always got a horizontal component. So, air resistance is going to cause a continual slowing down or a continual deceleration of the horizontal velocity. Obviously, if the horizontal velocity decreases, that's going to decrease the range, which is given by the... Um, so the horizontal displacement is the range, and we go the horizontal velocity times by the time of flight um, to give the range. Um, then... Um, we can also see this drag force has a vertical component. Now, on the way up, this vertical component of the drag force acts in the same direction as the gravitational force. So that means basically on the way up, the vertical velocity will decrease faster. I'll write this down in a sec. Uh, I just won't try and write it while I say it because that'll waste too much time on the video. So yeah, vertical component on the way up acts in the same direction as the gravitational force, so it slows down faster, doesn't go as high. But then on the way down, the vertical component of the drag force is in the opposite direction to the gravitational force. So it basically, it, it acts against gravity, so it, the object falls in the vertical direction slower. So if it falls in the vertical direction slower, that has the effect of increasing the time of flight on the downward path. So let me just pause for a sec and put that down in words. So how do we describe that all in words? Um, let me grab my cursor. The horizontal component of the drag forces causes constant decrease in the VH, the horizontal component of the velocity, therefore the range decreases. Um, and I guess, you know, if you wanted to be really specific there, you could say something like because SH equals VH times T, or, or relate that to the formula. So you're saying if VH decreases, then SH will decrease. If we look at the... Um, it's best to break this into the two scenarios. So if we look here on the upward path, the vertical component of the drag force in black acts in the same direction as gravity in blue. So the, the total force is increased. The total downward force is increased. Therefore, the maximum height and the time to reach the maximum height are decreased. 
So what does that look like? Over here, if we're comparing two projectiles, this top one is, um, if we're looking here with no air resistance, and the bottom one is with air resistance. And we can see that the net effect here is that the, um, we have, um, oops, that's a highlighter, not a pen, just going to undo. So we end up here with the um, lower maximum height. And it also reaches it earlier. What I mean by that, that's where it reaches the maximum height there. Where's the maximum height with our air resistance is there probably where that second dot is. Um, and then we also see down here that the um, range, yeah, wrong one, the range is also decreased. So with air resistance, the, the range is decreased, which is what I talked about first. Um, and the other thing, which is a bit hard to put in words, but we show with the diagram, the, without air resistance, the path is symmetrical. So it slows down at exactly the same rate as it speeds up when it falls, because the only force acting is gravity, and gravity is acting, the size of that force is the same, so it slows it down at exactly the same rate it speeds it up. However, we see this more non-symmetric path, when we take into account air resistance, and that is because we basically have this consistent loss of the horizontal component of the velocity. So because it's constantly slowing, 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 if you like, the, the range at the end is decreased, so it falls as its velocity decreases, basically it falls back to the ground faster. Um, probably haven't explained that terribly well um, but I think just the main thing you need to realize is be able to basically sketch that diagram um, and just show that as an artifact of all these other things that, that we're going to get this path that basically is going to be steeper on the downward path. Um, finally on the downward path, the vertical component of the drag force acts in the opposite direction to gravity. So the black line is up, gravity is down. Therefore, the total downward force decreases. So if we were to add those together, we have less force than with just gravity. Therefore, the time to fall de increases. Um, out of interest, it's not really in the course. It used to be in the old course. Generally... With air resistance, the time of, overall time of flight will decrease. So the increase you get on the downward path doesn't make up for the loss of time you get on the upward path. Um, but again, that's not in the curriculum statement now, so I won't write that down. But I'm really hoping in going through this activity, this helps you particularly with how you attack those explain type questions. And, um, and developing those skills in really clearly communicating those ideas because it is where a lot of particularly higher achieving students do sometimes lose marks. So that's it for projectile motion. Thank you.